This video is going to focus on uh, understanding an income statement, or as it's known in nonprofit, a statement of operations. So um, income statements, just briefly, or you can skip forward a little bit, um, income statements are one of several financial statements that are used to communicate the overall organizational health to external parties. So broadly speaking, uh, financial statements are used by the board to evaluate how the organization is doing, and then it, they are of interest to creditors or lenders, such as bondholders, as well as if you're a for-profit entity, they, might be, they would be of interest to investors. So there are four statements broadly that are, uh, are most commonly used, the income statement or statement of operations, the balance sheet, um, the statement of cash flows, and the statement of changes in equity. So this video will focus on the income statement. I will do a, uh, a separate video for the balance sheet. And then I'm going to do a third video looking at some ratios. At some point, I may also do a cash flow video, but cash flows are a bit of a headache. And I have done um, for the video around chapter 17 of uh, the Kapinski textbook, I did. I do cover cash flows in that video. So if you're looking for something on cash flows, uh, you can look at the video that I did on chapter 17 of Gapinski. I go into rather painful detail on how that works. So uh, data in this video is going to come from a real health system. I pulled the data from uh, their 2017 annual report. Uh, from the web. So this data is real. Uh, the data is for a nonprofit, small nonprofit system that consists of a hospital, a multi specialty physician group, a VNA, uh, and then they have some other things that are of, of less interest. But this is this data is aggregated. So it might look a little different if you were looking at it from, you know, from one of their components. But this data represents the overall organization. And again, it's not for profit. So that's going to reflect some of the different things we see in here. So starting to orient you, um, the income statement has three sections. So this is a statement of operations that you can see. Or income statement has three sections. The first section, which I've put a green uh, bar next to, is the um, uh, revenue section. So this first section, the first third, if you will, of the income statement focuses on the revenues that are coming into the organization as part of their core business. And I'm going to get into each of these uh, in detail here, but let's just kind of quickly, you know, do the 30,000 uh, foot flyover. Uh, the second section, which I put in with a red uh, uh, bar next to it is the uh, operating expense section. So this is where we put all of the expenses that are related to running the core business. And then the third section, which I have highlighted is or put the yellow bar next to are non-operating gains and losses. And so this section, we deal with things that are uh, expenses and revenues uh, uh, that are uh, and gains to the organization or losses to the organization that are not related to the core business of the entity. And uh, so in this case, we're dealing with a healthcare system. So things like um, uh, realized gains on investments, for example, this is not an investment organization, right? This is not a mutual fund or a hedge fund uh, or a holding company for, um, for doing investments. This is a hospital. And so things like... Uh, gains on investments uh, is belongs properly in this non-operating section, which means that these, this section, all this financial data comes from the fact that the, the organization is, is a business and is doing business, but it is not, um, it is not related to the core business of the organization, which in this case is the delivery of healthcare. Okay. So very broad over the top. Let me freeze these windows. Um, 
do, 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 freeze, freeze my pain so that we can manipulate this and keep the, keep our stuff here on the left. Okay. So coming back to the um, first section, this, the revenue section, the first line we're going to see typically in a healthcare delivery organization is net patient services, re net patient service revenues. Uh, and then it's here, it says net of contractual allowances. So not that long ago, had you looked at uh, a statement of operations for a hospital uh, or a clinic, you would have seen at the top uh, gross patient service revenues. And the, uh, those, those revenues are based on, if, if this is a fee-for-service organization, which the vast majority of healthcare delivery systems are. So assuming this is a fee-for-service entity, uh, what the number in that gross line, so the number that would be here if this was a gross line, would be based on the charge master uh, uh, dollar amounts. So every hospital uh, has a charge master, which is a menu of prices that the organization nominally charges for all of the services that it renders. So if you can imagine, um, you know, office visit would be on the charge master and it would be say $200. Um, and so if we had one office visit, your gross revenues would be one times 200 would be $200, right? So that would be your gross revenue. The thing is that um, over the last you know, 30 years or so, you know, we negotiated with, we have negotiated, our organizations have, you know, uh, routinely negotiate with insurance companies, third-party payers, and we uh, sign contracts with the, uh, these third-party payers and we agree to uh, we agree to take lower prices or typically uh, some reduction from our charge master rate. So some percentage off of our charge master rate. So if the charge master said it's two hundred dollars, we might have an agreement to take seventy five percent of the charge master rate. So 75% of $200 would be $150. Or we might agree to take 50%. So 50% of $200 would be uh, $100. So we would have, in the old days, we would have had a line that said gross patient service revenues. Then we would have had a line for contractual allowances, which would represent the amount that we were reducing the gross revenue by as a result of our uh, contracts with our third party payers. So you might start with 200, then you'd say if it was a 75% agreement, you'd then have $50 being uh, removed from um, as a result of contractual allowances, which would be the next line. And then you would have net patient service revenues. Because this is, because Basically, everybody knows that we all have contracts where the value is reduced. Um, most financial statements now don't even start, don't bother, or most income statements for healthcare organizations don't start with the gross uh, patient service revenue um, because basically everybody looks at that and says, well, that's just monopoly money. We knew we weren't going to get that anyway. Uh, we're setting that number high because we're going, we know we're going to have to um, take a, a significant cut from that. So it's kind of like you walk into a car dealership, right? And they've got the MSRP, the manufacturer's suggested retail price, and only a fool pays the MSRP. Everybody negotiates down from there. So that's basically what the charge master is, is kind of a starting point for a negotiation. It's not a number that um, people actually expect to pay. Uh, it's really just a negotiating point. Now, the other thing that's not listed here um, that is done uh, off the books, if you will, is charity, uh, the adjustments for charity care. So the two things that come off of the gross are contractual allowances, the reductions that we agree to uh, with our insurance companies and then charity care. So those two things uh, come off um, 
before we even get to the statement of operations here, right? So even before we get to the net patient service revenues, there's things happening um, that are are captured in that in this number here. So the organization we're working with here had uh, uh, net patient service revenue of 318, almost $319 million. So this is what they, um, uh, uh, based on their contracts, uh, based on their volume, uh, this is what they expected to collect. Um, and then, and remember, uh, because we are uh, doing accrual accounting, this doesn't mean that we've already collected that money. It just means that we have billed for 318, uh, almost 319 million. Now the next line down is the provision for bad debts. So because, and this goes back to what I was just saying, right? That 318, 319 million that we've billed for, we know historically that we don't actually collect all of the money that we bill for. So patients come in, they get care, and some of them pay and some of them don't. And so we know that some portion of the patients that we have billed aren't going to pay their bills. And so we, and we know because uh, we're doing accrual accounting and because we're trying to capture the best picture of our economic status, even though we don't know exactly how many how many people are going to do that to the organization? How many? How many? Uh, how many? How much our bad debt is going to be? Uh, we're going to go ahead and estimate it. It's typically a percentage of uh, our net patient service revenue. So we're going to say, well, it's you know some percent, two or three percent, um, something like that. So each organization has a sense of what that is going to look like. And bear in mind, bad debts are different than charity care. So a lot of people mix those up. Um, charity care which we've already talked about as having come out off the top line, out of the gross before we even get to net, right? Charity care is when we look at a patient um, and, we, and, and the organization evaluates, this patient uh, cannot afford care, so we're going to provide them care as part of our charitable mission. Bad debts, the patient has been evaluated as able to pay, but does not pay. Right. So these are people who we've, you know, we've evaluated their financial situation, and based on our, uh, based on our our charity care policy, we believe they should be able to pay, um, and so, uh, so this dollar amount ultimately winds up here. And again, it's an estimate. Um, it is not the. Uh, it is not the final amount. Uh, it is just a, our best guess. We eventually have a final amount. Uh, after the year's over and all the all the um, work is done by the finance department, right? The revenue cycle folks have done their best. Eventually, they arrive at a point where, they, all right, this is the amount that we can't pot. We we don't think we're ever going to collect, and that money gets written ultimately written off. So we have net patient service revenue. It's all, uh, often NPSR. You might hear me say NPSR. That's that's what I'm saying. I'm just saying it fast. Um, so we take our NPSR subtract our provision for bad debts. And you'll notice the parentheses here. So in standard accounting uh, format, parentheses mean that, th that this number is negative or it's going to be subtracted. So we subtract the provision for bad debts from the NPSR and we get NPSR less provision for bad debts, which is kind of our final, uh, if you will, top line revenue number, right? So you might hear top line, bottom line. So top line refers to your revenues. Bottom line refers to your net income. Uh, we'll get to net income in a little bit. So scrolling down here, and, and you know, I, I've got, typically you will line up at least two years worth of data side by side to get kind of a, a sense of a comparison. Um, you can line up as many years as you want. It just kind of gets, uh, you know, there's no, like, there's no formal, uh, requirement to have some number of years, but pretty good practice is at least one year uh, for comparison purposes. So this organization seems to be doing pretty well. All right. They've increased their um, NPSR by over uh, what, about 12 million. So that's, that's pretty good. Uh, disproportionate share funding is the amount of money that this organization is receiving from the state. 
to help compensate for the amount of Medicaid patients uh, that the organization takes. And so recognizing that Medicaid pays poorly um, between the state and the federal government uh, the the state allocates this money to the hospital, uh, and each hospital in the state will have a disproportionate share of funding or dish uh, funding. Um, so we get this in, and this is going to come up again later uh, because there is a matching tax uh, in New Hampshire that uh, helps pay for this. Uh, so we'll come back to that in just a second. So that's another source of revenue. So we have the uh, patient service revenue that the organization earns by, by delivering health care. We have the dish payment that comes from the state. It's a combination of state and federal money. Uh, and then the, then the organization has this other revenue line, right? So other revenue can come from a wide variety of sources. Um, it can be uh, things like... Uh, uh, payments for services, so for um, that are not directly related to to the delivery of healthcare. So things that go in here uh, for a hospital, for example, you're going to have a cafeteria, right? So the cafeteria is kind of an on uh, a part of the ongoing business of the organization. Uh, you know, day in, day out, you're going to be serving food to patients who are, you know, and, and guests, uh, and then, you know, of course, staff members. Other things that might go into other revenue might be the gift shop, um, might be uh, parking, if you charge for, bar for parking, and a variety of other things. It shows up here in the revenue section because it it is a, even though, you know, Obviously, running a cafeteria is not part of the core business of, of a hospital or healthcare system. It's a ongoing, predictable part of the revenue of the organization. And so that's kind of what I use to, to distinguish between revenues that belong in the um, revenue section and those that belong down here in the non-operating gains and losses is, you know, is it? It, it, even if it's not part of the core business, is it predictable? Is it going to be here year in, year out? And we'll talk about some of the other kind of cats and dogs that wind up down in the non-operating section. Um, but, you know, cafeteria, it's going to be there year in, year out. Uh, it's going to be generating revenues. And so it, it properly belongs in this kind of other revenue section. So we're, and we're distinguishing it from patient service revenue, right? As by calling it other revenue. Now, uh, the next thing here is net assets released from restrictions and used for operations. So what is that? Well, uh, when a hospital gets, or a healthcare system, in this, in this case it's primarily going to be the hospital, gets donations uh, from the community, sometimes the donors say things like, you can only use this money to you know, um, buy a new particular piece of equipment or to, you know, maintain the physical plant for this particular, you know, for the cancer center or, you know, something like that, right? So when those donations come in, they're earmarked and they are marked uh, temporarily restricted. When an appropriate event occurs that triggers the organization or allows the organization to use those funds, uh, then those asset, those those resources, that those funds are released uh, from their restrictions and used in operations. Now we're going to see in a second uh, donations showing up again down below. Let's see, where are they? Uh, unrestricted contri contributions. So the difference between net assets released from restrictions and used for operations versus unrestricted contributions, right? These are both contributions. So why is, why is some up here and some down here? Okay, so um, the reason that we have net assets that are released from restrictions and used for operations up here is a matching principle. So, um, you know, depending on the organization, there's a, you know, kind of, it, it, it depends. It, you just have... There's a lot here that is required by law, um, but there is some flexibility as to where this, where these things wind up being accounted for on the on the income statement. 
Um, so in this case, uh, let's imagine that this money was meant for some sort of improvement to the cancer center at this, in, you know, at this at the hospital in this organization. Um, and so uh, the the there was a need to make some improvements to the cancer center, and they had money that had been restricted specifically for the cancer center. They're able to, you know, they generate. Hey, we had one hundred twenty nine thousand one hundred ninety three dollars in um, in in repairs that we want to do to the cancer center. Um, so there's say, you know, $200,000 sitting in this fund, $129,193 of them would be released uh, and sh now show up as revenue earned by the organization. When the donation was made, because it was restricted, let's say it was donated five years ago, it only showed up on the statement of changes in equity. It didn't show up here uh, as, as income earned. Um, unlike the unrestricted contributions, which are captured as non-operating gains in the year that they are, uh, are received. So what will happen here is we, we spent $129,000 in doing stuff to the, um, uh, to the hospital, and then buried down here would be a matching $129,000 in expenses. So it would have shown up in, say, supplies and other and salaries of the people who are actually doing the work. So that's, that's where, so under a matching principle, right, where we want to have the revenues and the expenses matched together, um, we're treat, that's, how, that's why uh, uh, donations, when they are released from um, their temporary restrictions to be used for a particular purpose, the they're counted as revenue and then they're counted as an expense okay so now we take the npsr less the provision for bad debts the 310 million the dish payment the other revenue right our cafeteria and gift shop and other cats and dogs kind of funding that we have on an ongoing basis as well as the amounts that are released from uh, temporary restriction, add all that up, and that becomes our uh, total revenues and other support, or I got here, operating revenue. So I like to, I think of this as my operating revenue as opposed to my non operating revenue. Uh, so this is my, so this organization earned $328 million from their kind of ongoing operations. So that's the operating revenue section of this particular income statement. And as I said, every income statement you look at, healthcare, um, uh, uh, manufacturing, you know, uh, high tech, whatever, uh, they're going to have three sections just like this. They're gonna have revenues, operating revenues, operating expenses, and non-operating gains and losses. And then, you know, there's some complexity within that and they look different depending on, you know, particularly manufacturing is gonna look different than a service organization like healthcare. Um, but they're gonna have those same, you know, that same broad layout. So if you get comfortable with looking at an income statement for healthcare, you're gonna be able to pretty much look at any other organization because they're, they're standardized, um, uh, they're standardized uh, statements. So now we move into the expense portion of the income statement. And in any healthcare organization, your single biggest expense is uh, almost always going to be salaries and benefits. And you can see here that, uh, if we scroll over here to this common size, you can see that uh, in 2017, salaries and benefits were 58% uh, of the overall, uh, or, or, or represent 58% of total revenues earned. So they, they earned 328 million, spent 58% of that or 190 million on salaries and benefits. And I'll talk about common size a little more in a minute. So um, salaries and benefits, right? So typically a good wedge, uh, if you know how much sal salary somebody makes, a good wedge kind of esti to estimate the amount of benefits that, they're, that the organization is incurring is usually about 30%. Uh, that's a good ballpark. That's what I've always used. Then you have supplies. 
uh, and other expenses. So this is, you know, this has been, like I said, this has been aggregated up. Uh, this represents four or five different organizations. So there's a lot of stuff kind of being rolled up here. Um, and so you have supplies at 109, almost 110 million. Not surprising. The largest chunk of that will typically be pharmaceuticals, uh, followed by supplies used in the operating room, particularly uh, your orthopedics uh, uh, folks. Uh, but uh, and then after that, kind of pharmacy, operating room, and after that, uh, kind of it kind of flattens out. Depreciation. So depreciation is a kind of a complicated idea, and um, I recommend you know reading about it more. I'll talk here just briefly. Depreciation, whereas salaries and benefits and supplies, these are real cash expenses, right? If you have an employee, they actually expect you to give them cash or a check in which they will then cash and get cash. Um, supplies, same thing, right? Somebody sells you a box of bandages, they actually expect you to pay for them with cash, not you know some sort of IOU, um, at least not for very long. Depreciation is not a cash expense. So what depreciation is, and we're going to come back to this when we get to the balance sheet uh, in the next video, but the organization owns a lot of stuff. Right? So a hospital, for example, let's just look at a hospital for a minute. A hospital's got the hospital building. It has all the equipment inside the building. So kind of, you know, here's the church, here's the steeple open the doors, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff inside, right? <laughs> so, um, so you have, you know, you have the, uh, you have the building, go inside a hospital and you start looking around. You've got furniture, you know, waiting room furniture, you've got, um, you go into an exam room, you have, you have a, uh, an exam table, you have, uh, you know, all the equipment that, that your providers use to, to, you know, look in your ears and down your throat and, and so forth, right? You wander down the hall to the operating room, you have operating tables, you have, you know, instruments, you have uh, maybe a Da Vinci robot, uh, all kinds of stuff that that organization uses, right? So most of those things, well, we divide our property into things that we're going to expense and things that we're going to depreciate. Things that we're going to expense, we expect to use up within one year. You know, so bandages, for example, or syringes, hopefully, uh, are one-use things. You use it and you throw it away. Um, some things wear out very quickly, and so we'll just expense them anyway. So even though they might be used multiple times, um, they might, you know, we don't actually expect them to uh, have a long life. So uh, an example of that might be, you know, test tubes that you use in the laboratory that can be washed, um, but they're so inexpensive uh, that, and they break so easily that it's really just not worth tracking them individually. Uh, and so when they're purchased, they're just expensed. Um, however, if you buy something like a Da Vinci robot that, you know, costs you two and a half million dollars, and you exp and it has a useful life of know, let's say ten years, just to be simple. Um, you don't want to to expense that in the year that you buy it, right? So even with an organization with three hundred and twenty eight million dollars in revenues, if I buy a Da Vinci robot for two and a half million dollars, um, and I put that you know as a supply, you know that's going to bump up my supplies by. You know, Two and a half percent, almost right. It's all you know. Supplies is about a hundred million here. So if I so that makes a kind of a major impact, or better yet, imagine you're buying a new building and that new building is a hundred million dollars. You're not going to want to take the full impact, right? The full cost of that hundred million dollars in 2017. Why? Well, because the building, you know, according to the tax code, the building is going to last at least, you know, has a depreciable life. Right, a useful life of 39 years, which, you know, may or may not be accurate, but it's probably pretty close. Right? You know, if you build a hospital, you expect it's going to be around for a few decades. So why would you, so the, the purpose of depreciation is to try to capture the amount of economic value that we're using of the property 
right? Like physical buildings, plant. So the, the phrase property and plant kind of refer to physical buildings and equipment um, that we purchase for our organization. So again, going back to our, you know, either the extreme example of our building, right, which we're paying say $100 million for, if we were to put down $100 million in expenses uh, in 2017, that would make us look like we lost a whole lot of money, right? Because all of a sudden our operating expenses would go from 327 million to 427 million. And, you know, if we go down here to the end, our uh, net income is only 19 million. So that would be wiped, that would be totally wiped out. And it would look like we had a loss of $80 million in 2017. But then in 2018, we wouldn't have any bill for the, for the hospital, right? Because we paid for it in 2017. And we wouldn't charge ourselves anything for the, for, the, for the fact that we're using this really expensive, you know, nice, shiny new hospital. It's only one year old. Um, and so that's what, so depreciation tries to capture the reality that we've got this $100 million hospital and we're going to use it over many years. And so depreciation, like I said, it's not a non-cash expense. It is really just a kind of a, a nominal number that's put in there to try to capture the amount of economic value that we're using up of our property, plant, and equipment um, in, the, in the particular year. So in 2017, this organization is saying, we used up about $15 million of economic value from our property, plant, and equipment. So we got, we're charging ourselves mixed into this big number because it's lots of stuff, right? It's the building, it's their vehicles, it's their, you know, all their, all their medical equipment, you know, x-ray machines, MRI, and, you know, their Da Vinci robot and all that stuff. All that stuff is aggregated here. And we're saying we're using up a percentage of that stuff. And when we get to the balance sheet, we'll look at how much stuff is that. Um, but we're using up a percentage of that stuff and we kind of add up, well, you know, we used up one fortieth of our building. We used up one tenth of our Da Vinci robot, and you know somebody in the finance department adds all that up, and they come up with a fifteen million dollar bill. But they don't pay that to anybody, right? Um, it's just there to help us capture how much uh, um, value this organization has produced. And if we didn't put that number there, it would be like we were. doing this stuff without doing all the services, you know, providing all the services we provide without uh, recognizing the fact that we're doing it in a hospital, you know, in a building that we bought, you know, that the, you know, that the community bought for us uh, with expensive and valuable equipment that, you know, does in fact lose value over time, particularly as we use it. So depreciation is a complicated idea. Uh, you know, uh, check out uh, the lecture for chapter four of Gapinski. Um, we go into more detail about that. Okay, so long diatribe on uh, depreciation, but it's an important concept. And again, I'll talk about it some more when we come back to talk about the balance sheet in the next video. Now, uh, I mentioned a minute ago when we were looking at the dish payment right back here, the disproportionate share funding, uh, this organization received 6.4 million uh, in payment from the state, you know, including uh, federal matching funds. And this is how the state of New Hampshire uh, pays for the dish, uh, the dish funding. And that is um, they tax all the hospitals, uh, the Medicaid, a Medicaid enhancement tax, which gets put into a big pot and then gets redistributed uh, in the form of the disproportionate share funding to organizations. And so the Medicaid enhancement tax is a percentage of uh, net patient service revenue. Um, and then the disproportionate share funding that, that the organization gets back uh, is based on um, the, uh, uh, the population that the organization serves, how many people have Medicaid, how many are uninsured, and so forth. So um, as you can see here, the Medicaid enhancement tax is significantly larger than the disproportionate share funding of about 5 million. So when you net these two numbers out, right, 
um, this organization is a net contributor to the state's um, DISH uh, funding. So it's a net contributor to other organizations that have that serve poorer communities. So if we were looking at a uh, organization in, maybe in the North Country or someplace where there are, you know, um, uh, where the population is less well off, uh, those numbers may be inverted and you'd have where the dish payment would be smaller than the enhancement tax. But in this case, this organization, as you can tell from this, uh, these numbers serves a wealthier community. And then, um, uh, and then the organization pays interest on loans that it has, and those loans might be you know, traditional loans, and they might also be um, bonds. So this organization does have some bonds outstanding. A bond is just a kind of uh, loan that you get directly from the market. We'll talk a little more about that on the balance sheet. Okay, so now we get to total operating expenses. So above here we had you know, total operating revenues. Here we have total operating expenses. And so when we subtract operating expenses from, uh, from revenues, we get income from operations. Now here's uh, where having some side-by-side -side comparisons is useful. This year, this organization made 175,000 in income from operations on revenues of 328 million. Uh, last year, they had made 10 million on revenues of 314 million. So something changed, um, you know, and uh, uh, this year their operations are not as good uh, as they've been in the past. Okay. Um, so now we've covered. So this is um, these first two sections deal with the core business of the organization. Now the next section we get into is non-operating gains or losses. Um, and so these are not all necessarily all bad, good or bad. They're, it's a mix of both. Uh, and you know we added up here at the end and they wound up with 18 million uh, to the good. So let's look at different uh, the different components here. 85,000 in unrestricted contributions. So they had 85,000 in donations to the organization from people that just said, here's, here's money. Um, do with it what you think is most appropriate for the organization. So they had a relatively small amount there this year. They had more in the prior year. Um, they had 1.8 million in investment income and dividends. So as a not-for-profit, most not-for-profits, you know, they uh, set aside money to help fund future investments. And so it's not unusual for not-for-profit organizations to have uh, large endowments that they're that they're managing. Uh, the money is being set aside ultimately to well to to help the organization continue to function, but also be able to make major capital investments like you know buying a new building. Uh, so this year they had 1.8 million in uh, uh, investment income. So they owned some sort of investment uh, that paid out. Uh, uh, income and or dividends. So income would be, say, they owned the bonds of other organizations. Uh, dividends are typically paid by, you know, because they own in their portfolio, they own some stock. So that's, um, so that, so that's what that line is. The next line is realized gains on investments. So this means that they um, sold investments and realized the gains. So the difference between unrealized gains on investments and realized gains on investments is that, and you can have um, realized losses and unrealized losses as well, uh, is that realized gains means, you know, maybe they had a thousand shares of General Electric, right? you know, the, the company General Electric, and it went up. Uh, the stock went from $100 per share. I have no idea what General Electric's current share prices, but let's say it went up from $100 a share to $150 a share. Uh, I'm going to quiet my computer down. Um, went from $100 a share to $150 a share, so they would have, and then they sold it, right? So uh, if they had 1,000 shares, they would have made 
$50 per share, 50 times a thousand would have been $50,000. So let's say they, part of this gain might've been that they had, they had bought the shares at a thousand and now sold it at, um, or they bought it at a hundred, they sold it at 150. So they made $50 a share. So that's a $50,000 realized gain because they actually sold it. Um, and so that's what this means is, is they sold investments that they owned um, and, and had uh, gains of $13.2 million. Now, unrealized gains on investments means that um, they do, they're doing what's called marking to market. So they have, they have, so let's imagine now instead of uh, selling the investments, uh, so let's say, imagine they, they have the, the thousand shares of General Electric and instead of selling it when it went up to 150, they still are holding it in their uh, portfolio. Well, now their portfolio is worth, instead of 100,000, it's worth 150,000, right? Because it was $100 a share times 1,000 shares. Now it's $150 a share times 1,000 shares. So the portfolio went from 100,000 to 150,000 but they haven't sold the shares yet. So the difference here is that would be an unrealized gain because it, it, they haven't actually taken the gain. They haven't made the sale to capture that $50,000 in cash. Um, but it does increase the uh, economic uh, capacity and, and, and resources available to this organization. And so they put it here as a non-operating gain, even though they haven't actually got, you know, even though they still are sitting on those investments. Um, interest rate swaps is they've got, bond, what this refers to is they've got bonds. They made some um, uh, changes to the, to, the, to the arrangement of the bonds. I don't know the details behind this, so I don't want to get into it. But basically, they did some finance work, and it has to do not with the operation of the organization, right? Not with the delivery of healthcare. Um, but with the way that the organization is financed, which is why it's down here in non-operating gains and losses. So they, so this year they they made some money on those arrangements. Last year they lost some money. Um, so yay, they they made money. That's good. Um, but again, it's just it's just finance stuff that that um, uh, that the CFO is working on to you know try to maintain uh, financing of the organization. Next line here is contributions to community programs. So this is, again, because this is a not-for-profit entity and not-for-profit hospital, one of their requirements uh, is to, is to uh, provide community benefit, right? So they have to do a community benefit uh, plan, um, and they have, to, they have to then capture the contributions that they're making to the community. And so this organization helped fund uh, $792,000 worth of community programs. So a not-for-profit, the reason a not-for-profit has to do this, right, is because uh, for-profits con con contribute to community programs by paying taxes. Not-for-profits don't pay taxes. And so one of the, uh, one of the expectations is you're going to give back to the community somehow or other uh, through your mission. And so one of these you know, so this organization is is making direct contributions to support community programs, and then other cats and dogs. Uh, so typically, you know, it's not big enough. You know, the, all the all the other little little things not big enough to have their own individual lines. So they're just kind of aggregated here for that twenty seven thousand. Okay. So then we total up all of the non operating gains and, and losses, and it gives us eighteen million. So, and to get the excess of revenues over expenses, or in for-profit language, it's also known as net income. So you'll hear that. And I will probably use that because saying excess of revenues over expenses takes me too long when I can just say net income. So if you hear me say net income, that I'm really, I really mean excess of revenues over expenses in this case. If this was a for-profit company, we would say net income. Um, so you add the income from operations to the non-operating gains and you get the excess of revenues over expenses or net income. 
Uh, so this organization goes from having earned only 175,000 from its operations um, to having a uh, net income of 19 million, thanks largely to the fact that it had a very good year uh, with its investments. Last year, so we do, do a comparison, it only had 5 million uh, in, in non-operating income, mostly because again, the investments, if you look at this year over year change, uh, they did, they got about 9 million, almost $10 million in, in a, you know, from selling off re, uh, assets that they had, uh, investments that they had, um, helped fund this or the organization this year. Okay. So we've gone through, so ultimately, of course, you want a big number here, as big a number here as you can get. You prefer it to come from here. Uh, so, so in this case, it's good that the, the organization has, you know, a nice big number down here um, of, of, you know, $19 million, but most of it, of it this year in particular comes from the non-operating gains in particular from this, you know, this jump in, um, in uh, uh, gains that it got from uh, selling off uh, investments. So this is a hospital, not an investment company. So we really want our, our, our revenues, you know, our, our net income to be coming from our operations, right? Because this is quite fickle. They've done really well, but pretty much everybody's done really well in the last couple of years, right? 2017, we're still in a bull market, that bull market, right? The stock market's been doing great. And so this hospital is benefiting from that. Uh, or this, this organization is it's more than just a hospital. But this organization is, you know, it's, it's invested uh, uh, assets, have, it's done very well for it. So where, where we really want to see the, ideally where we want to see the, you know, the income for the organization coming in is, is here in the income from operations, because that's the core business of the organization. That's where we want to see the organization making its money. Um, and this is the area where the, where management really is supposed to be imposing its primary control. Management can't do much about a bull market that, or a bear market, right? That's just, that's just like, you know, taking credit for, um, you know, the sun rising in the East, right? I mean, it just, it is what it is. Uh, you know, the organization, I mean, the organization can obviously position itself better um, for, to make gains in the, in the market. But again, it's a hospital or a healthcare organization, not an investment company. Our managers are supposed to be working up here, trying to work these areas, right? Bring down expenses as much as possible, bring revenues up. Uh, of course, ideally you want, this number to be big too, if you can, you know, we'll take it. But this is not typically, a, is not a reliable number. And you just look at the changes over time uh, and you get a sense of just how, you know, unreliable and inconsistent it actually is. All right, so speaking of changes over time. So now we've gone through kind of all the lines, a typical, you know, and the structure of a statement of operations. I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about how I would analyze um, you know, doing a very rough analysis uh, of a statement of operations or an income statement, right? So the first thing I want to know is year over year change or Y over Y, -O -Y right? Year over year change. And I'm going to do this. If I'm sitting there looking at an income statement, I'm going to kind of run down the, you know, that's why I want to have at least two columns. I want to have at least, at least two years, maybe three, um, you know, if I'm serious about it, I want, you know, 10 years, if it's an older organization, be able to look kind of at trends. But two gives me a kind of a sense of what's going on, right? And so what I want to do is look at, um, so next we want to look at year over year change. Um, so here, for example, uh, you know, if I'm doing a quick analysis, I'm going to run down and look at, let me just do a quick eyeball check, you know, 2017 versus 2016. What I'm looking for are big changes. So spreadsheet's beautiful for that because, you know, you can just copy a formula down and you instantly have it. So scrolling down here, you know, I'm looking, all right, I got $10 million change. That's a pretty good change. Uh, you know, and the other thing that's useful, particularly if you're using a spreadsheet, is you can also kind of plug in 
give me the percent change too, right? So 10 million is a lot of money. It's a lot more than I have. Um, but how big of a percent change is it actually? So in this case, it's 3.4%. Not that bad, you know, not, not that much. Um, and, and one of the things you want to keep in mind here is, you know, you're going to expect some increase year over year just from inflation, right? And so if inflation is say 2%, well, I would expect, you know, year over year, my revenues to, to match inflation at least. Um, so, so, you know, management can only claim um, credit for a portion of the increase in revenues, you know, because I say, well, you know, inflation was 2%, and that's, you know, that was built into the pricing. So you didn't really do anything great if, you know, you only increased by 1.4%. I'm, I'm, uh, management here is great. If they're listening, you're great. You're wonderful. Um, I'm just saying, you know, we're going to build in some assumptions as we look at percent change um, o- over time, right? And one of those factors that you're going to kind of keep in your head is, is this organization, you know, uh, staying pace, keeping pace with inflation. Uh, bad debts, you know, way down. That's good. That could be because uh, they're managing things better. Um, you know, we had a big drop off when the ACA came in and a lot of people moved from charity care to, um, or, you know, from, well, not charity, well, from charity, but also, you know, just started paying their bills uh, because they had Medicaid, Medicaid. So they moved from, you know, private pay, meaning they're paying out of their pocket uh, to being covered by Medicaid. Uh, so that was a couple of years ago though. So that's not what this is. So not sure what, what, what went into their assumptions about their reduction in, in provision for bad debts, but you know, that's a good thing. Um, so then, you know, NPSR less provision for bad debts is up about 4.2%. So if we figure, you know, inflation was running at about 2%, then, then management was able to increase, uh, uh, revenues by about 2% over inflation. So that's good. Um, you know, and, and here's the, the, the thing you want to look at is, well, how did everybody else do, right? Or how, look at, you, you're always going to want to look at comparing yourself to yourself, meaning yourself over time. So compare yourself in 2017 to 2016, right? Uh, but then also you want to compare yourself to similar size, similarly situated competitors. So if you're a you know, community hospital, in Southern New Hampshire, then you want to compare yourself to other community hospitals in Southern New Hampshire to look at, well, how'd they do, right? Did they get a 4% increase uh, year over year? Uh, well, okay, then it probably means you, you all are doing about the same. Uh, dish share funding, I, I wouldn't get too wound up about because that's a, you know, that's a gift from the government. Uh, other revenue is up a bit. That's good. You know, so selling lots of cookies in the, in the uh, cafeteria, maybe uh, hard to say there. And then uh, this is another one where, you know, yep, it's a big change looking at, you know, assets released from restrictions. Uh, but again, that's going to be kind of random. You know, you're going to hit the trigger that allows you to release the, release the dollars. So I wouldn't get too wound up about it. So two things you want to look at, right? One is the kind of just the, the absolute change, like $10 million is a lot of money. Um, and even though it's only 3.4%, that's something to kind of think carefully about, uh, you know, going from 76 to $129,000, you know, even if that is a, almost a 70% increase, you know, that's a drop in the bucket uh, relative to the $330 million, you know, in revenues that we're bringing in. So, you know, we want to look at that overall percent change, um, you know, looks good. So then we keep going down and you know, expenses in particular, you want to really, you know, as a manager, that's where you have your most control. So you really want to drill in here like, okay, 8.4% increase in salaries and benefits. That's a, that's a lot, right? That's a lot um, of a uh, large increase. Now we had an increase in revenues. So that probably could mean, you know, and it's more than just inflation. So it could mean that they're doing more, uh, more patient care. And so therefore they need uh, more uh, bodies. 8.4% is a big increase in, in um, your largest single uh, expense, right? And here again, we have both an absolute, you know, increase of almost 15 million, as well as an 8.4% increase. So that's, you know, that's something to really pay attention to. If I was a board member or a lender, I'd be like, okay, tell me what, 
what's going on there. Why you have a 4.4% increase in revenues, but an 8.4% increase in salaries and benefits. Tell me what happened. Um, same with supplies, you know, so supplies is a little more complicated. Again, supplies are heavily, so, um, so one piece here would be, okay, salaries and benefits up by 8.4%, but inflation, right? Your employees expect uh, to get a cost of living increase. And so if, if the CPI, the consumer price index is up by 2%, then they're probably, you know, at a minimum, they're going to expect 2%. So the, so the, uh, the actual growth here is less than 8.4%. You're going to lop off the 2% that would have gone, uh, that, that employees just kind of expected as a result of, of inflation. And uh, so, but you still have to justify 6.4% 6 is a lot to explain still, uh, especially when growth after you adjust for inflation, you know, again, kind of being a little bit arbitrary here was only up 2%. So you have a you know, 6% 6, 6 inflation adjusted uh, increase in salary, a 2% inflation adjusted increase in revenues. So what's going on? Still, still applies. Um, supplies is a little bit different animal. So, you know, supplies are going to go up by inflation. But when I was working with uh, and making projections about supplies, in a healthcare organization, you know, you're going to have a couple of different classes of supplies. Like I mentioned, as I was starting to explain this, the biggest uh, supply expense for a hospital uh, or healthcare organization is typically uh, medications. Well, pharmaceuticals, medications, right, uh, their inflation rate is different than, say, the papers and pencils and other stuff and Band-Aids that you use in your organization. Pharmaceuticals have a much higher inflation rate. So let's say if I were making a projection about supply, supply expenses, I might look at you know, the $50 million you spent on, um, on pharmaceuticals last year, say, and I'm just making that number up. I don't actually know what they spent on it, but I would, I would look at the $50 million in supply in, in pharmaceuticals that we spent. And I would say that number is probably going to go up by say 7%, um, next year or 9% next year because pharmaceutical inflation has been higher than any other kind of inflation. Then I might have other medical supplies. So that might be, um, you know, uh, uh, disposable, uh, disposables that are explicitly, you know, for use in the OR or other uh, procedures, things that are related to, you know, medical, medical care. And I would, I would give a higher inflation rate to those. So let's say I spent 10 million on, on supplies for the OR. Um, I would allow maybe a 5%, you know, inflation rate for that supply line or that portion of the supply line. And then looking at all the other supplies, you know, would kind of lump in with stuff that's non-medical. Um, I would expect those like particularly non-medical supplies, like, you know, paper and pencils, uh, to move at about the same rate as the CPI, the consumer price index, which is, which is the number that when you hear people talk about inflation in the United States, what they're really talking about is the CPI number. Um, so supplies are more complicated, right? It's, you know, that $109 million is really an aggregation of a whole lot of different kinds of supplies with different amounts of uh, different rates of inflation. So, you know, you'd want to kind of keep that in mind as you start to evaluate, okay, 7.5% increase, is that good, bad? I don't know, it depends. You'd have to, you'd have to drill a little further um, to, to, uh, to make a judgment about whether uh, the organ, you know, whether that's just inflation or some, or, or is that, you know, the organization is actually spending more on uh, supplies. Uh, depreciation, we talked at length about, so that it's a small increase in, in depreciation. Um, again, the, the, the met tax is what this is known as, um, uh, is kind of outside the organization's control. So, you know, be cognizant of it, but you know, there's nothing you can do about it. And then interest, not that big a number here. Um, so 15%, but you know, it's 15%, big number, uh, $122,000 change, not that big a number, right? So not something to get too wound up about. Uh, and then, you know, so, uh, uh, operating expenses, uh, 
increased by 7.8%. Uh, you know, that's something to talk about, you know, especially since uh, revenues only increased by 4.4%. Uh, big drop off in, in, in income from operations. So we definitely want to have a conversation about that. Uh, you know, all of these numbers are, you know, all of these percentage changes are large relative to the percent change in, uh, in revenues coming in, which is what's you know, driving um, the significant decrease in, in, in income from operations. Uh, down here again, you know, uh, you know looking at non-operating gains and losses, you, you want to pay attention to them, but, um, and you shouldn't ignore them, but doing the kind of analysis that I was just doing above starts to kind of be, uh, uh, no, I'm not sure it's really worthwhile uh, because we expect these numbers to bounce around, right? They aren't tied. Those numbers aren't tied to uh, the, the operation of the organization, right? They're, they're somewhat arbitrary, like I was talking about here uh, with the realized gains on investments. It's a bull market, you know? It's a bull market and that has nothing to do with the, with the management of the organization. That's just, you know, that's just luck that we happen to be living during a bull market. Okay, so, um, so going back up here, now this last set, two columns uh, called common size. And I'll do this again for the balance sheet as well. But what common size allows me to do is kind of look at the composition uh, of the organization, uh, of, of the balance, uh, excuse me, of the statement of operations. So what I do to calculate the common size uh, numbers for each year is um, I divide each of these numbers by the total revenues uh, and other supports, so the, the, the operating revenue. That becomes my denominator for all the rest of, uh, of the entries in the column. So that's why it's 100% and everything else is a little bit off from 100%. So the common size then becomes a percentage. Everything is expressed as a percentage of total revenues and other support. So for example, um, going down here to uh, salaries and benefits, salaries and benefits represents 58.1% of the total revenues and other support. So they brought in 328 million, right? And then they spent 190 million of that 328 million on salaries and benefits or 58% of their revenues went to cover uh, salaries and benefits. So the common size statement is useful to kind of get a feel for where's the money going, right? Where's it coming from up here? And then where's it going? How's it being spent? Um, it's also useful to do kind of a year over year comparison as well uh, to get a sense of is the composition um, of, of the statement changing over time? I do, you know, it, it, you may you may or may not want it to change. I guess I was going to say, ideally, you don't want it to change, but that's not true. Um, uh, you may want it to change in particular ways. So this is kind of like, a, you know, like, like if you ever do like a body fat estimate, like how much of your body, you know, I weigh 190 pounds. How much of that is fat? How much of that is muscle? How much of it is bone? You know, um, uh, so if you do something like that, you want to, you know, that's what this basically is, is like a body fat estimate. Uh, of your of your organization's uh, statement of or income statement, so that ha that's helpful as well for doing that you know uh, comparison uh, uh, year over year. I want to talk about before so I'm, so that is pretty much it for the uh, income statement. I do want to talk about two ratios uh, before uh, before I switch. Uh, end the video and move on to the balance sheet. And then, like I said, I'll come back and, and spend more time on ratios. But two ratios that kind of stand out that are the most common associated with statement of operations or the income statement. Yeah, the first one is um, operating margin, which is here. And operating margin is operating income, which is, in this case, Oh, excuse me, I want to sneeze, um, is this 175,000 in this year or 10 million in, in 16. So 175,000 divided by uh, 
the operating revenues. So, and what operating margin tells you is how well is the organization doing um, based on its uh, core operations. So a operating margin of 0.1% isn't that great. 3.1 is a little more respectable. Um, what we're looking for, you know, for operating margin, the industry average is about 3.5%. So we want to, you know, so what we want to do again is compare ourselves to to some sort of industry standard, but also compare ourselves to similarly sized organizations in our same geographic area. So a tenth of a percent isn't very good uh, for an operating margin. Now the other um, uh, the other uh, ratio that's commonly associated with the income statement is the uh, total margin, uh, also known as the profit margin, and that is net income divided by total revenue. Uh, so for this organization in 2017, it was 5.4%. It's 5.49%, sorry. And um, so that's an increase from 2016 going from 4.8 to 5.49. But most of that gain, you know, most of that margin is actually coming, right, from non-operating gains, uh, as we discussed, right? They, you know, they only earned about a tenth of a percent from their income from operations. Uh, the rest of it is coming from non-operating gains. So. Uh, if we compare to uh, total margin from the prior year, yeah, they're up a little bit, but th all of that increase is coming from uh, the non-operating gains. If we go here and we compare, it's useful to compare operating margin and total margin because operating margin tells us how well an organization's core business is doing versus total margin, which sucks in you know, the fact that it's a bull market and their investments did really well. Okay, so that is uh, a review of the statement of operations, otherwise known as the income statement for a for-profit entity. Uh, hopefully that's useful to you. Next video, we will focus on the balance sheet.